I think we can start. What do you say? Okay, so uh, sure. I'll start by introducing uh, you, Angie. So um, welcome to VSET. Uh, today we have Angie Lee, who's presenting a rash rationing attention theory of eco chamber. This is joint work with Lin Hu and Xu Tan. Um, as usual, uh, this is going to be a one hour presentation with an additional 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Anchi scholars are not here with us or not reliably here with us today. So if you want to ask a question, it's probably best if instead of using the chat, you just um, unmute yourself. But in any case, we will be patrolling the chat so we, we can forward the Anchi your questions. Um, before we let Anchi speak, just a reminder that uh, next week we have uh, Simon Bohr from UCLA and he's going to talk about an equilibrium model of experimentational networks. Okay, um, and also please remember the as as normal, uh, this is recorded. Okay, Anchi, um, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for inviting me. Can you, uh, can you guys all hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so as Francesco just said, uh, this is my joint work with my two co-authors and uh, Ling Hu is at Australian National University and Shi Tan is at U of Washington. And the title of the talk is the rational inattention theory of echo chamber. So the first question that I typically get would be, uh, what, what is an echo chamber? Well, according to the Cambridge English Dictionary, an echo chamber is an environment in which people encounter only beliefs or opinions that are consistent with their own so that their existing views are reinforced and alternative ideas are not considered. So let me give you a few examples of phenomena that fit this description. So this is a picture that's taken before the 2004 US presidential election. So the dots in this picture represent, oops, uh, the dots in this picture uh, represent political blocks. So the blue ones are liberal ones and the red ones are conservative ones. And the arrows between these dots are referrals. So as you see that, actually more than 90% of the referrals are between blocks of the same political leanings. There are a few of them uh, that uh, connects between the liberal and the conservative ones. Now, more recently, there is this debate about whether or not we should vaccinate our children, not against COVID, but against uh, measles and rubella. So this is Italy's vaccination debate. Um, the dots in this picture, which you don't see clearly, represent Twitter accounts. And uh, these are the skeptical ones. And these are the ones that ad advocates for vaccinations. And the thing here is between these dots represent retweets. So once again, you see that most retweet happens between uh, Twitter account with the same ideological camp. So um, despite the recent popularity of echo chamber as a subject matter, in the popular press and more recently in, the, in our academic research, I think our understanding of echo chambers is still developing. And indeed, most existing discussions about echo chamber would touch upon, if not focusing on its behavioral roots. And, but today I'm gonna to tell you a rational theory of echo chamber. And why are we interested in rational theory? Well. Uh, from a positive perspective. This is clearly a phenomenon that deserves better understanding from various angles. And from a normative perspective, if our positive theory, rational theory, is proven to be relevant, then we could examine its normative consequences. So hopefully the theory that I'll present you today would achieve at least some of these objectives. And the premise of our theory is rational inattention only, abbreviated as RI. So more precisely, I'll be modeling uh, the rational and in particular the flexible allocation of our limited attention capacities across information sources. Now we've been in the relevance of our eye um, because recently there, like the internet and the social media have become an important source of information. And compared to the colossal amount of available information out there, it is our attention that's creating our bottleneck on us. And this has forced us to be selective about uh, which websites to go through and uh, which people to follow on Facebook and Twitter. But at the same time, 
uh, we could use algorithm driven systems to specify, hey, this is my preference. So I'm interested in this, this type of content, but not the other type. And then the algorithm is going to like uh, direct us to the stories that we are interested in. So to some extent, uh, in some sense, uh, the allocation of our attention could become more flexible over time. So based on these premises only, we're gonna show as the first theorem of the paper that echo chambers would arise as the unique equilibrium outcome in limit situations. So I'll be more precise about what I mean by echo chambers and what I mean by limit situations in the upcoming slides. And in the second part of the paper, uh, we take a closer look at what happened within an echo chamber. So we develop a methodology for characterizing the opinion distribution inside echo chambers. And uh, as a few highlights, for example, we show that even a small amount of initial heterogeneity between people's attention capacities could generate fat tail distribution of public opinions. And finally, we examine the normative implications of our theory for information platform designs. We show that uh, many platforms that are recently designed to disrupt echo chambers, to battle the rising polarizations, if they are implemented, they could have very dire social consequences for consumer welfare and for public opinion distributions. So uh, that is a very quick overview of the paper in a nutshell. So unless there are questions, uh, here's today's agenda. So I've spent most time on introducing the model setup and then analyze the model. Um, if time permits, I think there are very there are a few very interesting extensions that I would like to briefly describe and hopefully uh, we could conclude with a brief discussion of the literature and uh, maybe continuing the discussion of the literature um, afterwards. Any questions so far? Okay, so, yeah, can ask. so here, oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, can I ask <laughs> one question? So you talked about wanting to look at a rational model of echo chamber formation as an alternative to behavioral rules. I was just wondering if you could say something about why you think that's the right way to approach it. Is it sort of because you think in the examples you talked about, people are approximately rational or is it just to use a more sort of standard model like we see in most economic models? I think it's the second answer. And I believe that uh, once there are, if there are behavioral models then there should be some rational models. And then later we could discuss which part of the prediction is testable, like it's unique to the rational models, but not to the behavioral models. And these would be testable predictions that would separate them apart. Right. So just by looking at the pictures, I couldn't tell uh, if echo chambers are driven by rational reasons or irrational reasons. I mean, in practice, I believe it's both. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the model setup. Uh, so I'm gonna describe the model. Maybe there are, I think, four slides and then I'll pause and gather questions, okay? So there is an uncertain state of the world. I'm gonna denote it by omega. Uh, that's either left or right. And each state left or right occurs with 50% probability. So there are finite players denoted by I, and each player's action is either left or right. You could take one of these two actions, and a player's utility function depends on his action and the true state realization. So in particular, if the two objects match each other, uh, then the player's utility is the highest, and I'm going to normalize that amount of utility to zero. Now, if the two objects mismatch, then the player makes a mistake. Okay, he isn't matching his action with the state realization, so he experiences a disutility. But the magnitude of that disutility depends on uh, whether the player is taking his default action or not. So the default action of the player is also called his type. That's, ice, and that's also left or right. So how does it work? Well, if the player is taking his default action and if he makes, makes a mistake, then his disutility is negative beta i. If he's taking a different action from his default action and he's making a mistake, then his disutility is negative one. Okay, so throughout the talk and throughout the paper, I assume that uh, beta one is between zero and one. 
So what it means is, is the following, right? Given complete information, suppose that omega is publicly observable, then of course is optimal just to match your action with the state realization. But given incomplete information about omega, then horizontal preference between these two actions start to matter. And in particular, given the prior belief about omega 50-50% distribution, because beta i is between zero and one, you have a strict preference for taking your default action. Okay, and such a preference is called, is parameterized by beta i, I will refer to this parameter as the preference parameter. So to give you a story, suppose that omega captures uh, which of the two candidates, the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate has a higher quality. Now, uh, player i is just a regular citizen, he's going to express support to one of these two candidates, and his utility is the highest if he's supporting the candidate with the highest quality. Now, if he makes a mistake, then his horizontal preference between the two candidates is gonna affect his disutility. So some players are democratic voters. So uh, ex ante, given incomplete information, given the prior belief about Omega, he has a strict preference for supporting the democratic candidate and other people uh, have strict preferences for supporting their, uh, their, their Republican candidate. Okay, and uh, the, the, the magnitude of such a preference is captured by beta. Now, information about omega, about the true state, is generated by two primary sources. That's called the left revealing source and the right revealing source. So these are non-strategic entities, and I'm going to refer to them as sometimes as technologies. Okay, so how do they work? Well, in state omega, the omega revealing primary source is activated, and its job is to reveal that the state is omega. So it's going to generate fully revealing news saying that, hey, the state is omega. Whereas the other source is inactive. Okay, so there are two possible state realizations, and there are two primary sources that specialize in the reportings of different state realizations. So this is a slide that's taken from Chair Amirandov. A 19, a 2019 paper. If you, for, for those of you who are familiar with the literature, okay. So later, I'm going to build a connection between the specialized reporting technology of the primary source and the bias of the primary source. But that comes in a few slides. Now, in order to gather information about Omega, uh, players have to pay attention to the various parties that are outside in the economy. So this slide is very mechanical. It's going to define the set of the parties that a player could pay attention to, as well as his strategy. And on the next slide, I'm going to explain how attention works. So for player I, the set of the parties he could pay attention to include the two primary sources, as well as all the other players than I. Okay, As you'll later see, all the other players could be used as secondary sources. But this is the set of the parties that a player I could pay attention to. Now, what is an attention strategy of player I? Well, that's a vector denoted by Xi. And the vector specifies a non-negative amount of attention that player I could pay to party C, subject to the only constraint that the total amount of attention paid by player must not exceed his bandwidth. Tau i is an exogenous parameter that's called the bandwidth, and that captures the total amount of time that player i could spend on learning the true state of the world omega. Okay, so throughout the talk, uh, i is the, no, it doesn't matter. Well, now let's fix a strategy profile that we gather across all players. Okay, so it's a huge vector, but given that vector, here's how attention works. So information about omega is gonna be circulated in the society for two rounds. In the first round, the state is omega, okay? And the omega revealing primary technology is activated. By activation, I mean that it disseminates fully revealing news about omega by using the Poisson technology. So the there are independent Poisson processes that hit different individuals, and the arrival rate of that Poisson process is normalized to one. Given this technology, as well as the amount of attention that player I pays to the primary source, 
the probability that the news disseminated by the primary source reaches player I with this Poisson probability. Okay, so let's take a look, closer look at this expression. Now, first of all, notice that this probability is increasing in the amount of attention that the recipient of information, which is also always in the subscript, uh, the amount of attention that the recipient of information pays to the sender. The more attention that I pay to the primary source, the more likely that I'm gonna get the news disseminated by the primary source. Now, the second observation is that because attention is limited, right? because this animal is bounded above by tau i, by player i's bandwidth, uh, this probability is strictly bounded above by one, which means that attention is limited, Right. Even if I exhaust my bandwidth on this primary source, there is still a strictly positive probability that the news disseminated by the primary source fails to reach me. So there is always a strictly positive disruption probability. So that's denoted by delta. So delta stands for the disruption probability. And as a matter of notation, as I said throughout the talk, the superscript always denotes the sender of information and the subscript denotes the recipient of information. Okay, so that is a standard slide, that, that's a standard step. Now, the next step is our contribution. We assume that, well, in the second round of information transmission, those players who've learned about Omega in the previous round, they're gonna pass along the news to the other players using Poisson technologies. Okay, so when they're passing along the news, they're non-strategic, they're just automatically post whatever they read from New York Times on their Facebook account. So the technology used by player I has an arrival rate lambda I. So this is an important parameter that's called the player I's visibility parameter. It intuitively captures how capable he is in terms of disseminating information. Is there a question or? Okay, so uh, think, what are we factors? Uh, I think Sergey yeah. might have a question. Yeah, it was uh, technical. So what does X subscript by superscript W minus rev? So you said W uh, dash rev is the technology. Mm -hmm. um, it's the primary source of information. I is the player. Right. Uh, uh, so, so this denotes the amount, the, the amount of time that the recipient of information spends on listening to the source. So uh, that's a superscript. It's not some exponent, right? So no, no, no. So this is the name of the primary source. That's called rref. Rref is just a, the name. is a notation. No, no. I understand. I understand. Okay. So uh, when you put it as a superscript, it doesn't mean exponent. It's just no, no, no. It's just uh, from yeah. It's from one party to the other. So uh, the interpretation of x super sub, uh, subscript i superscript w is you said it's the time. Or what's the interpretation? It's the amount of attention that player I pays to the primary source. Okay, and uh, that's the thing that gets summed up to be less than uh, lambda, which is the upper bound on the total mm -hmm. budget of attention. Okay, thank you. Yes. Can I ask a different question, Anchi? Um, yes. Do, are you going to have an assumption? I at, at first I thought this was obvious, but now I'm not so sure. Are you going to have an assumption that there is a different cost to paying attention to the primary sources as opposed to the secondary sources? Um, at first I thought obviously you must have that assumption, but now I'm not so sure. It might even work without that. It's, uh, it's an excellent question. Now let's step one step back. Let's take a look at uh, the previous slide and this slide. Okay. On the previous slide, so what this inequality says is that uh, I, as a modeler, I'm not imposing any restriction on how the player could allocate the limited bandwidth across the various sources out there. Okay. And uh, typically you see that uh, these things are scaled by the same constant one. But there's an indeed different cost associated with paying attention to the primary source and the secondary source. Okay, so there are two reasons why the costs are in essentially different. The first reason is that the visibility parameter of a secondary source could differ from the visibility parameter of the 
primary source. So let me explain how the visibility parameter works and then I'm gonna point out a second reason, but this is a great question. Okay, so Lambda I is the Poisson arrival rate of and the technology. Uh -huh. Since, I mean, I also have a question about the information technology. So if you uh, put attention- can I? Uh huh. Yes, if you, I mean, if the if the player uh, pays attention to the to the full information revelation source that corresponds mm -hmm. to left, and the true true state is right, mm -hmm. so he he doesn't get any signal at all. No, I mean the Poisson rate is exactly zero, right. Ex exactly. Okay. So uh, when the state is right, then the technology that specializes in the reporting of left is silent, is inactive. So no matter how much attention you pay to it. Uh, you don't get a signal, okay? So uh, how does the Lambda thing work? Well, uh, there are factors that affect Lambda, like some people more active on Facebook. And there's also in political science, there's, there's this idea of opera effect. Basically, opera Winfrey is much more effective in disseminating political news to the, a very large audience because they watch her talk show and because she's very enchanting to watch, or maybe she's good at deciphering the very complex message of New York Times to people who are not well educated. So regardless of the interpretation, and there are factors that are, could, could affect the dissemination rate of information of player I as a secondary source. Okay, so by allowing player I to differ from one, uh, implicitly there are different cost and benefit associated with paying attention to the primary source versus the secondary source, right? For example, if Lambda is very, very large, uh, then you're, you're more likely to get news from the secondary source than from the primary source um, because of that techno technological difference, okay? So given this, uh, the sender's dissemination technology, as well as the amount of attention that the recipient pays to the sender, so I'm talking about player J as a recipient and player I as a sender. Okay, so I is in the superscript and J is in the, uh, is in the subscript. So in that case, the probability that the news disseminated by player J reaches player I with this Poisson probability. So this probability is increasing in the sender's visibility parameter. It is increasing in the amount of attention that the recipient pays to the sender. Okay, there is always a strictly positive probability that the channel between these two parties is disrupted and the exponential term, uh, the delta term captures the disruption probability. So the technological difference explains part of the reason why I face a trade-off between paying attention to the primary source and paying attention to the secondary source. Now, Francesco, there's a second reason, which is also very important, is that notice that any information that's passed along to me from a secondary source is a garbled signal of uh, what the first, what, what the primary source tells my secondary source. Okay, so suppose that I set lambda i to one. In that case, nobody should pay attention to any secondary source because you just pay the entire attention to the primary source and that's the most, that's the best way to do. So the only reason for why I'm gonna pay attention to a secondary source must be because Lambda is actually strictly greater than one. So only those players with a Lambda that's strictly greater than one could potentially be used as a secondary source in equilibrium. Okay. Can I ask a question now, here as well? Um, um, can I wrap up the timeline sure. and I'm gonna, then I'm gonna pause and address all the questions. Okay, so here is a summary of the game sequence. Uh, first of all, players choose the attention strategies that specifies how much attention I'm gonna pay to each primary source and potentially to each other player. And then given that joint strategy profile, that's gonna, uh, the state is realized and then news about the state is disseminated in the society first from the primary source that specializes in its reporting to players, and then information is circulated among players themselves. And then after that, uh, each player is gonna form a posterior belief about the true state realization. For each player, there are only two possibilities, right? Either I learn that the state is omega, either from the primary source or from some other friends, 
or maybe and alternatively I just don't learn anything and in the second case I have to form a posterior belief about uh, the state distribution in order to take an action that maximizes my expected decision utility in the first case I'm just going to match my action with the state realization okay so that's the game and the solution concept that we're going to use today is pure strategy perfect Bayesian equilibrium okay so that uh, concludes the description of the model and then now is a great time to pause and gather questions. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I was just wanted to ask about these two sources. Why do you have two sources that specialize? Um, and mm -hmm. in particular, in, in models with um, flexible kind of information acquisition, there's a benefit to from listening to some kind of aggregator that summarizes what is important to you. Mm -hmm. So, so it seems to me that. It, um, it, there would be a benefit for each agent not to listen to primary sources, but to listen to some kind of, you know, a blogger who parses through that all that all that information, listens to both, and then delivers uh, an optimal action for each individual. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and there are various. We address this question in various parts of the paper. So the first point is that why do we have two primary sources? Well, a cheap answer is that there are two states, so there are two primary sources, but that's a joke. Okay. Um, so the reason is that later I'm going to actually, uh, I, I bet you know the paper of Chair Mirandoff, um, but later I'm, I'm going to reinterpret the specialized reporting strat uh, technology of the primary source as a bias of the primary source. Okay. And then you're gonna see that uh, people due to their horizontal preferences between different actions, uh, they're gonna self-select into different primary sources. And because of that, they're gonna self-select into like-minded friends who share the same preference because the information acquired by my friends could be useful for my decision-making. So that's our mechanism for generating echo chambers. Now, what you are suggesting is absolutely correct, is that if I merge the two primary sources together into a mega source, okay, that's gonna disrupt echo chambers. And then there is a part of the paper that analyzes the welfare consequences of this policy intervention uh, from uh, using one of our comparative statics results. So whether or not we have specialized reporting or an aggregator or a mega source matters. And recently there are actually policy debates about whether we should have you know, specialized reporting or maybe we should have a platform. One of the platform built by Berkeley people says that we should present people both liberal and conservative leaning articles so that uh, they get a holistic picture of the reality. So the comparative statics of, our, uh, the, of the later part is gonna to speak to these issues. This question by Arda. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I have a question about the timing. Um, so when people choose their strategy, do they choose it like I commit to in advance, like to the following strategy, like 50% of my time I'm gonna, you know, to this primary source and then the remaining 50% I'm gonna mm -hmm. devote to this person, or is it time contingent? Can I change it when I hear about one source? So you see that uh, based on the description of the time sequence, uh, it's a commitment, uh, we have commitment. Mm -hmm. So they commit to this vector at stage one and then they're not going to adjust their uh, attention allocation based, uh, based on subsequent, uh, what I observe from the primary source. I'm not sure how allowing for the sequential Sequenti uh, allowing for sequentiality is going to affect uh, the analysis. Uh, and that's not on top of my mind. So I wouldn't claim that the model, the predictions doesn't change. Um, I'll have to think about that, but uh, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah. One more quick question. So but at the beginning of yeah. the game, everybody knows everybody's default action. So that's a common. So I, I, mm -hmm. I know in advance that who yes. is going to follow which. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. I would have thought that the commitment doesn't matter because everything is perfectly revealing. And so you can just condition the strategies on not having heard yet because it, once you hear, it doesn't matter what you did. But maybe I'm missing. I, I, I think so, but uh, that's what I want to respond. But I, but I, but, uh, but yeah. I want to be careful. No, no. I, I suspect, I, 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 I won't be surprised that this is true, but 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just All right. Can I ask a, a so, clarification sure, uh -huh. question? Sure. Uh, so you are talking about this like Poisson process. So you think mm -hmm. that there is some limited time horizon among uh, in which the like communication can happen or like I can acquire yeah. information. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 So, and so, then I make, by the end of this, at this horizon, I make a decision. Very much by the time you exhaust your bandwidth, then you couldn't learn anything anymore. But um, bandwidth is, it's, uh, it, it puts intensity in the Poisson no, no, thing, no. right? Bandwidth is the total amount of time that you could <sighs> wait. And uh, the, the division of the bandwidth means how long you could wait for each source, for information to arrive from each source. And then because that bandwidth is limited, then after a finite amount of time, you have basically, you have to stop. You have exhausted your resource. But I could, but wait, could, alternative... for, but I could wait for a year and then start paying attention, right? Uh, that wouldn't be beneficial if you could, uh, if you, if you delaying decision isn't, uh, isn't beneficial here, yeah. Oh, but isn't it more likely that someone will have uh, gotten clear information by later no, on? So the pro yeah, exactly. So as you see that, this is a great point is that, so you see here, here, there is nothing fancy about the sender of information. Okay, so they're non-strategic. They just mechanically post whatever they learned on their Facebook. Um, but uh, the bottleneck is really on the recipient part. So given that uh, this is the way we set up the model, I would suspect that uh, just perturbing the model along this direction wouldn't yield uh, significant changes. Now, in reality, if we believe that there are more significant things happening on the sender's part, which we abstract away from, then delay decisions and waiting could, uh, writing, uh, writing down a richer dynamics model could be more interesting. That's my, that's my, yeah. You. Maybe you can just okay. think that there's an election in a week and then everything works because you can't wait for a year. <laughs> that, that's, that's also, um, it's, it's, it's that, that's a restriction coming from the decision problem. Yeah. So uh, let me set up the model and then because I think I've used up more time on explaining the model setup, I have to go through things a bit faster. Uh, but thanks for the great questions. Actually, I could now explain a lot of things actually intuitively rather than using notations. But for the sake of formality, let's take a look at uh, a player's problem, okay? So players are playing games and how do they form their best response functions? Well, let's do backward induction. At the decision stage, as I have alluded to, now, if you learned that the state is omega, uh, then you just match your action with omega. Now, if you remain uninformed of the state, that event is denoted by UI, okay, oops. Uh, if you remain uninformed of the state, that must be the case that all channels that you're trying to build that connect you either, that connect you to the primary source, either directly or indirectly, uh, all these channels are disrupted, okay? So given player's joint strategy profile, that's a vector that gathers everybody's attention strategy, and get true state, distribute, uh, true state realization, the probability that we are in event UI is just given by the product of the disruption probabilities. So this is the probability that the primary source information uh, doesn't reach me because of disruption. And this is the probability that the information generated by the primary source uh, doesn't reach me through player J. So either player J doesn't hear from the primary source or uh, the channel that connects J to me is disrupted, okay? So taking that as given, so in the event UI, so that's a di di difficult decision problem. Right? I have to choose uh, between taking my default action or taking a different action. Now, if I take my default action, then this is the probability that I actually make a mistake. If I make a mistake, and then multiplying this mistake, prob mistaken probability by the magnitude of my disutility, which is negative beta i, that yields the expected utility generated by the state contingent plan, which is to say, if I don't hear from anybody, I'm gonna take my default action. Now, if I take a different action, 
uh, in that event UI, I have a different um, mistaken probability. And uh, that's the expected utility generated by this alternative state contingent plan. So the maximum of the numbers is the expected payoff that I'm trying to maximize at the attention pain stage. Okay, so formally at the attention paying stage, I'm maximizing this maximum. Um, that's my expected payoff uh, by choosing an attention strategy, a vector, uh, taking the strategies of the other players is given. Okay, so, uh, and then a solution to this problem, which is actually, which actually exists, uh, is gonna be my best response function. And uh, then we have standard uh, PBE, okay? So the rest of the talk is denoted to um, uh, is denoted to understanding this decision problem, uh, but before that, I'm going to throw at you a bunch of definitions. And uh, one of the definition is really important is to reinterpret the uh, the specialized reporting technology of the primary source as the bias of the primary source. But the first slide is trivial. I say that two players are like-minded friends if they have the same default action or if they have the same type because these things are just the same thing. So all democratic voters are like-minded friends and the set of the democratic voters, the set of type left players are denoted by the calligraphic L and all type right players are like-minded friends and the, the set of such players are denoted by calligraphic R. Okay, so this is a common terminology in the literature of, of uh, echo chambers. So that's bringing our discussion closer to uh, the discussion in the literature. Now, the second slide is what I promised is, uh, is very important. So a primary source is biased towards action A. If hearing no news from it would increase your belief that uh, the state favors action A. So what does it mean? Suppose that we have the left revealing primary source that generates news revealing that the state is left. Now, if you do not hear from that source, you're gonna update your belief in favor of action right. And that's why I say that the left revealing source is biased towards action right. And it will be denoted by small letter r. And conversely, the right revealing source is left biased and it will be denoted by l. Okay, so this is convoluted, but this is a standard slide that we take from Chair and Miran Dock's uh, AER paper. For example, uh, you may wonder what is the New York Times? So uh, the New York Times turns out to be left biased. And why is it? Because it occasionally generates, uh, because it occasionally endorses the Republican candidate. And there are empirical, very famous and empirical researchers demonstrating that uh, uh, it is these endorsements that go against the bias of the newspaper that are, uh, uh, that are the most effective in shaping voters' beliefs and decisions. So in other words, from our perspective, uh, it is the endorsement of the Republican candidates that make New York Times uh, newsworthy. So, uh, but if you do not see New York Times endorsing the Republican candidate, uh, you should update your belief in favor of the Democratic candidate. So that's the uh, essence of this definition. Any questions? Okay, cool. So now uh, I'm gonna talk about a player's own bias source. So a player's own bias source is the source that's biased towards his default action, which means that if you do not hear any news from that source, you're gonna increase the belief that you should take your default action. Now everything matches. For example, if you're a democratic voter, if you're a type left player, and then your own bias technology is the New York Times. And if you're a Republican voter, then your own bias technology is Fox News. Fox News is a bad example, but um, we don't have much, much better examples either. Uh, but that's, that's the definition of the own bias source. Now, why do I have these definitions? Because eventually I could talk about what it means for echo chambers to arise in equilibrium. So uh, here's the description of players' own past behaviors in an echo chamber equilibrium. At the attention paying stage, everybody pays attention to his own bias primary source, as well as his like-minded friends. These are the players who share the same uh, default action as the player. So that is my attention allocation strategy. Uh, and the description applies to everybody uh, on the equilibrium paths of an echo chamber equilibrium. 
Now, as a result of everybody playing this confined attention allocation strategy, you could easily see that at the decision stage, if I learn Omega, then I match my action with Omega. But if I don't hear from any party that I'm trying to connect to, then I am going to update my belief in favor of my default action. Okay, that's just by definition. And then in that event, together with your preference for taking your default action, given the prior belief, right? Now your belief is even more in favor of your default action compared to the prior. So what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna take your default action in that event. Now, actually, if you calculate the probability of this event in which you remain uninformed of the state uh, in an echo chamber equilibrium, you're gonna find that that probability is more than 50%, which means that most of the time, you get your predisposition reinforced. But alternatively, you're exposed to cross-cutting content that disapproves of your default action. Uh, and in that event, because you're rational, then you're going to support the other candidate. The probability of that event is very small, but the belief that you form in that event is going to be very, very strong. So as a result of we are having a Bayes theorem, uh, you see that uh, we have this occasional belief reversal together with most of the time a reinforcement of your predisposition. And those phenomena have been documented in the empirical literature. And finally, uh, here are a bunch of uh, functions. Don't remember the functional forms, but uh, I'm gonna tell you the derivatives because I'll have to invoke these properties. So first of all, here's a function of phi that is decreasing in this argument. So that's important. Phi is a decreasing function. H is an increasing function in its first argument, but the slope of H is bounded between zero and one. So uh, later we'll use these assumptions, these properties, and I'm going to re-invoke these properties when they're used. Okay, any questions? Yeah, I have one if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so maybe I'm... Uh just not paying attention well enough. So if you go back to the definition of own biased source and uh, echo chamber def, uh, equilibrium. Yeah. So own biased is the one that is more likely to reveal information that uh, will uh, favor your default action, right? That, that this is the definition of own biased. No, so to be more precise, a known biased source reveals disapproving evidence of your default action. So that if you do not hear from the own bias source, you're gonna update your belief in favor of the, uh, of the default action. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I understand. So then my issue is, okay, so let's, let's talk in very real terms. So what you're saying is that I'm in an echo chamber equilibrium. If I read the New York Times and I hear nothing bad about the Republican and that's why I vote Democrat, um, mm, no, no, no. Seems... So, so, so if I read New York Times and, and, and if I don't see New York Times endorsing the Republican candidate, then I think that the Democratic vote uh, candidate is a better choice. Okay, no, I understand that part of the logic. So, but mm -hmm. your modeling relies on the fact that what I'm looking for in my echo chamber sources, especially the big ones, is sort of the information that nobody looks for when they're in an echo chamber. If I, you know, my, my intuitive understanding of any echo chamber is that the reason people join it is because they like hearing whatever the sources say. So what you're saying is in your rational model, uh, a rational individual would listen precisely for the opposite reason. Right. So, okay. That's interesting in itself and uh, would be worth a debate, but it seems like a, uh, a little bit of a failure of the model, if you don't mind. No, that's actually what I would like to promote in my research agenda is this occasional big surprise part of uh, paying attention. And you see evidence for cross-cutting exposures, like people seeking disapproving news. And then if you, they don't see di disapproving news, they're going to take their default action. Uh, for example, by a very famous documentation of Flexman, Go and Rao, uh, they look at uh, what people's belief distribution after 
consumptions of social media, internet, a lot of information sources, and they find exactly this pattern of occasional exposures and uh, occasional belief reversals and most of the time a reinforcement of the predisposition. And they somehow call it a miracle or, or, or some kind of puzzle, but uh, from a rational or Bayesian perspective, that's exactly what will be predicted by any um, Bayer's rule. Now, the, the, in reality, there are, of course, confounding factors, right? Uh, you consume news not because just you want to improve your decision. Uh, it could be for entertainment reasons. And that, therefore, in that case, you're going to hear something uh, constantly telling you that your own party candidate is great. Uh, that that's going on in reality, but uh, that's abstract away by us because uh, it's it's just uh, it's not what news is what news is about uh, in, in 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 any rational model. Uh, rational models of decision making and you acquire information because you want to improve your decision. Okay, but you point out a very important reason for why people are acquiring information in our equilibrium, and that's going to affect the subsequent analysis. Maybe so. I think one thing here is this seems like an important difference between the rational and behavioral model. One question I might ask to push a little on this is, I know there's research finding that Fox News makes people more conservative, um, or exposure to Fox News makes people more conservative. Do you have, how would that sort of fit in? Do you feel like that that's something that doesn't quite fit with your model because it would say that wouldn't happen on average and so people aren't quite rational or is there an explanation for this? So um, it depends on what you mean by being more conservative. So mm -hmm. here is, so what it means here, what, what this definition or what our prediction says is that uh, actually you be, if more conservative means that if your, your belief is more in favor of the Republican candidate, if that's my definition of being more conservative, then as, as a result of playing the echo chamber equilibrium, actually the majority of people uh, more than 90% of the people, depending on the parameter, uh, they could become slightly more conservative compared to the prior belief, 50-50. But there is always going to be 1% of them that actually realize that, well, uh, Fox News actually sometimes criticize Trump. Whether or not people pay attention to that, I don't know. But uh, there, are, there are going to be people who are convinced that, well, uh, they should take a different action, but the probability of that event is very small. Okay. So I think I'm definitely going to run out of time, which is actually fine. So what I'm going to do in the remaining 10 to 15 minutes is to uh, explain the reason behind why echo chambers would arise in equilibrium. Uh, then it, I definitely don't have any time for doing uh, the opinion distribution within echo chambers. Um, but uh, I'm going to tell you the punchlines and the main takeaways. And uh, I think depending on what the audience wants to take away. Some people more prefer to read the second part of the paper than the papers online, uh, you could read it, okay? So uh, continuing the discussion about uh, what we are trying to do in this model, what, what players are doing, right? Let's analyze an equilibrium. So the first step is to uh, look at the following lemma. Now, suppose that players could not pay attention to each other. Their only choice is to spend their tau eyes across the two primary sources. Okay, so in that case, uh, we're just solving a bunch of uh, decision problems. There's no game to talk about. And uh, the lemma one is, is old, it appears in the literature, but in the current context, it just basically says that everybody should pay attention only to their own bias primary sources at the attention paying stage um, and not paying any attention to the other primary source. And the reason is, as suggested by Sergio, is that, uh, well, why do I want to pay attention? Well, I always have an option of just paying no attention. In that case, I have the prior belief, which is common knowledge, and then I'm going to choose my, uh, take my default action, which is optimal by the specification of the preference structure. Now, in order to improve upon my decision utility, that's, that explains why I pay attention. I'm gonna look at uh, disapproving news of my default action, okay? But if I do not hear from any, hear any disapproving news, then I'm going to uh, more prefer to take my default action than ever, okay? Then from the fact that tau is a finite number, 
Are you going to spend the entire bandwidth seeking for news that disapproves of your default action? As a result, you're going to pay only attention to their own biased primary source. Okay, so uh, the takeaway from this, uh, this slide is that um, heterogeneous preferences in the decision problems that faced by players, together with limited bandwidth, uh, generates demands for heterogeneous information. Okay, so now let's bring back the possibilities that players could talk to each other. So what I'm doing on, on this slide is a uh, folk theorem type of result. So I'm taking, I'm fixing something uh, while taking other things to the limit. So what I'm fixing is the population size of those types of players, as well as the personal characteristic profile that include their visibility parameters and bandwidth. What I'm varying is the player's horizontal preference between the two candidates or between the two actions. And the result shows that when such a horizontal preference is sufficiently strong, meaning that I incur a very small disutility when I make a mistake from taking my default action. So that what th is what this statement means. When, such, uh, when my preference for taking my default action is sufficiently strong, then any equilibrium of our game uh, must be an, an echo chamber equilibrium. And moreover, such an equilibrium exists. So uh, why is it? Well, uh, let's do backward induction. Right? At the decision stage, there's this problematic event in which I don't hear from anybody, so I have to form a posterior belief. And uh, in, in principle, that's a very difficult problem. But suppose that I have a sufficiently strong preference for supporting uh, taking my default action, then because everything is finite here, right? When my preference is sufficiently strong, I'm going to take my default action in that event, uh, regardless of the belief that I hold in that event. Now, doing backward induction, this means that at the information acquisition stage, at the attention paying stage, I'm going to focus on the own bias primary source that generates disapproving news of my uh, of my uh, disapproving news of my default action. I'm not going to pay attention to the other primary source, and the reason has been articulated as above. Now, for the same reason, as I've alluded to in the introduction, is that uh, I'm going to limit attention to my uh, to the other players. Now, to my like-minded friends, because these are the friends who share the same primary source as mine. So they could be used as secondary sources in case the transmission of information from the primary source to me is disrupted. Okay, so they are substitutes for my primary source, for my communication to the primary source. So this proves that when preferences are sufficiently strong, any equilibrium of our interest must be an echo chamber equilibrium. The existence of the equilibrium will become clear, but uh, it's not covered here. Okay, so let me just wrap up and make a few comments about uh, this, uh, make a few comments about uh, this echo chamber equilibrium. I, I think because I'm running out of time, uh, I have to postpone the question after I finish this slide. Okay, so uh, notice first that this is a quite robust phenomenon. Like actually we devote the first part of the paper just to formalize some ideas that we have. Uh, robust in the sense that, well, uh, limited attention capacity together with heterogeneous preferences generate heter demands for heterogeneous information. And that implies that people would talk to their like-minded friends because uh, the information they acquire from the primary source is useful to each other. Now, this is a robust result. Uh, for example, you could allow for multiple rounds of information transmission uh, in, in, in the analysis. Uh, you could uh, consider alternative attention technologies, not necessarily Poisson ones. And you could also allow for richer state space and action spaces. You have to modify the definitions of echo chambers a little bit, but you're going to prove a similar result. Okay. Now, also notice that what I'm proposing here is a sufficient condition for echo chambers to arise in equilibrium, that's by, def by no means the only sufficient condition. Uh, for example, in the appendix, we show that when this population is sufficiently large, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, the Democratic and Republican voters or type, type left and type right players, they, they have a large population, then we show that any symmetric equilibrium of our game must be an echo chamber equilibrium as well. Okay, and finally, now you may wonder, is echo chamber efficient? 
uh, well, in general, it is not efficient. So how do we see this? So suppose that instead of letting players play their equilibrium, uh, we have a social planner that di dictates the attention network between, between people. Okay, and uh, what the social planner can do is to do the following. He could force both types of players to pay attention to both primary sources, strictly positive amount of attention to both primary sources. Later, he's going to point out to a Democratic voter that, look, you should talk to a Republican voter as well, uh, not limit your attention to your like-minded friends. And this is because these people, are Democratic, a Republican voter pays attention to, uh, reads the New York Times too. Okay, so what this configuration is doing is that it qualifies a significantly larger population as secondary sources. And for some parameter values, having more secondary sources available in the economy is going to facilitate information transmission and generates a greater amount of social surplus. But uh, regardless of the condition it, it is, um, such a gain cannot be sustained in any equilibrium, uh, provided that the conditions I told you, either here or in the appendix, hold true. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm running out of time. So let me give, it, give you a very, very quick overview of what we did for uh, the opinion distribution within that echo chamber. So basically now we zoom in and take a look at uh, one echo chamber that consists only of, let's say, uh, type left players. So we show, uh, for example, that we could uh, pin down the equilibrium by solving this system of equation. So what is this system of equation? Well, you may wonder, uh, when is player I going to receive a positive amount of attention from player J? Well, it turns out that this is equivalent to player I pay a sufficiently large amount of attention to the primary source. And if that amount crosses the threshold, then player I is going to start to receive attention from uh, his friends. And indeed, he's going to receive a constant amount of attention from all of his friends. Okay, That amount depends positively on the amount of attention he pays to the primary source. And of course, it depends on his personal characteristics. So in order to pin down the equilibrium, we, we have to solve this system of equation that concerns the amount of attention that player pays to the primary source. And this is amount that I refer to as the player's resourcefulness as the secondary source, because it just captures how much information he acquires from the primary source, and that determines how much information he could, dis he could disseminate to the other players. Okay, once we solve this system equation, we're going to plug in the solution into this expression to back out the attention network between like minded friends. So now you see that, first of all, we have existence of equilibrium. And secondly, we could have a core peripheral architecture in which those players who have large bandwidth and high visibility parameters, they're going to form a core. And they're going to pay attention to the primary source and to each other, where there are peripheral players, they don't pay, they're ignored by the rest of the society because they don't cross this threshold, but they're going to tap into the call for secondhand information. And also notice that players' investments in their resourcefulness are strategic substitutes, because if I pay more attention to the primary source, I become more resourceful, then that's going to attract the attention of my like-minded friends away from the primary source to me. Okay, so these players become less resourceful. So based on these strategic substitutability, we do a bunch of comparative statics. For example, we show that if you increase the bandwidth, the attention capacity of a player by epsilon, you're gonna promote the resourcefulness as well as the influence of that player in that echo chamber. And more importantly, uh, such a change is going to diminish the importance and resourcefulness of any other player. That's any other player, which means that if we start off from a little bit of initial heterogeneity among players' attention capacities, uh, such heterogeneity can be magnified into a very uneven distribution of public opinion. Some people are going to act as opinion leaders, and other people are going to act as opinion followers. Okay. Uh, then we also did comparative statics for people's lambda uh, visibility parameter. And we find that uh, the result is not as obvious and we have interpretations for that result. 
Okay, for example, there are recent debate about whether the internet company should exercise more content controls, let's say banning Trump from getting access to the platforms. Well, uh, if this is modeled mathematically as changing key players visibility parameter because of some external intervention, then the result here suggests that, uh, well, we have to be very careful about uh, the model parameters because you could have unintended consequences. For example, you want to diminish the importance of Trump supporters. If you don't estimate the model correctly, then you're going to end up promoting the importance of Trump supporters. And finally, this goes back to uh, one of the questions raised at the very beginning is that what's going to happen if we have uh, an aggregator? What, what's going to happen if uh, instead of having two separate sources, we're going to merge the two sources together? Okay, so actually we could address that question from a comparative statics concerning players' population size, but I'm gonna explain the intuition very, uh, very briefly, then I'm, I'm gonna conclude. Okay, so I borrowed two minutes. So suppose that instead of having two primary sources uh, specializing in reporting different state realizations, suppose that we merge the two primary sources together into a mega source. So everybody has no option, but just to pay attention to that primary, uh, to a mega source. Then what's going to happen? Well, first of all, now it makes sense for people with different preferences to pay attention to each other because um, whatever that's read by a Republican voter could be valuable for my decision making as a Democratic voter. So in that sense, we managed to disrupt echo chambers. Well, congratulations. But is it a good thing or bad thing? Well, I don't know because if it used to be that I'm only paying attention to Democratic voters, and now I'm paying to attention to the entire population that includes both the Democratic and Republican voters. It just means that there are more secondary sources available. That means that I, as an individual, would have less incentive to acquire information from the primary source. That's a free writing problem. And if everybody's reasoning in the same way, then the total amount of information that the society as a whole acquire from the primary source may diminish. And eventually, if I have time to show you the expression for equilibrium expected utility, what it matters for players equilibrium expected utility is the total amount of attention that all players together acquire from the primary source. Now, because of this free writing problem, having more secondary source available may reduce players' equilibrium expected utility, which implies that some recent attempt to build platforms that force people to read those kinds of articles could be welfare reducing, uh, if not welfare enhancing. Okay, so uh, that's all I'm trying to say today. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, I'll be happy to address more questions or continue the discussion. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. I just want to ask uh, Krishna if he wants to get us started, and then uh, other people can jump in. Yeah, I can ask about something I'm often interested in these models, which is you mentioned that you're sort of first theorem or main result about getting echo chambers would be robust to having multiple rounds of communication. Is that, do you feel like in that world, things are sort of mostly similar or are there also interesting new phenomena that would show up there? So uh, that's a great question, thank you. So let's take a look at this expression, okay, at the very beginning. So when, what we did is to write down the probability that uh, you're not gonna hear anybody. So that's a very important event. Now with, with more rounds of information communication, you don't have this very nice clean product structure because it becomes a combinatorial problem. Like if I don't hear from you, then, you know, if, even in a large population, uh, I haven't figured out a way to actually write down an explicit formula for this disruption probability. So what's, uh, what, 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 what's the implication of this difficulty? Well, it is twofold. If you are interested in the result on echo chambers, that's a very robust result because here we're, we're basically saying that because things are finite, right? There are limited bandwidth and finite number of players. So if my horizontal preference is sufficiently strong, maybe so strong in some 
then, then I'm going to take my default action uh, in the event of UI, regardless of the, how exactly I down the formula for that probability. Okay, I could, there exists a uniform, there exists a uniform upper bound that depends on very few parameters. So in that sense, I could still show you this limit result. Maybe I need a different threshold, um, but this folk theorem type of limit result is gonna hold. Now, but anything that I'm gonna say <laughs> that I skipped uh, within echo chamber is we're gonna have a huge problem with it. So the characterization for opinion distribution within echo chamber uh, hinges uh, crucially on the assumption of two rounds of information uh, transmission, because without that assumption, we don't, we don't have this nice formula. Uh, even if this is a nice formula, it turns out to be very difficult to analyze, like especially if you take a look at this comparative statics result. It says that, well, if you promote the importance of someone, that's necessarily going to diminish the importance of everyone else. Like to my best knowledge, this is a new result in games of strategic substitutes. And we exploit the very few assumptions, but real assumptions that we make when proving that result. Uh, actually, we develop some new methodologies for doing that. But two rounds of information communication is an essential assumption that facilitates this assumption. So it depends at various parts of the model that, that assumption play different roles. Yeah, no, that's all. That all makes a lot of sense. And I guess what I'm wondering is more if you have an intuition, you know, if I know that this is hard to solve, if there were some way to solve the more than two rounds version, do you think sort of it wouldn't be worth doing because you already get most of the insights or do you think there would be new things to learn there? Maybe you don't have to find um, it. <laughs> I don't have an intuition. I, have, I struggle a lot even when I write down like three players with three rounds of communication. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't think that even taking mean field approximation would uh, help you to solve any problem. I, I, there, there's one route is to say, well, why don't we let individuals be infinitesimally small? But then the number of paths that you have also explode with the number of individuals. So it's not clear to me, like if we have, a, I, I, my initial conjecture is that when the society is large enough, that then this kind of complication might be washed away by the large population. I don't have any intuition or any formal proof. And I actually, I don't think that's true. So uh, I don't have a counter example either. So, 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 uh, so basically I don't have a good idea of what's gonna happen for the subsequent characterization uh, when I have multiple rounds of more than two rounds of tr information transmission. Yeah, I think Oda has had a question for a while, so. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. go ahead. And so I have one more question, which is like similar, which is like an obvious extension, but very difficult to characterize. Um, so suppose that at the end of this game, people do not decide individually, but there is a voting process and collectively we decide on an action and then we receive mm -hmm. our payoffs. Do you mm -hmm. think the inefficiency is gonna disappear? Because the way that you characterize it, it seems like a very straightforward external history. Like the, there is an inefficiency because people are gonna use the information that I get in the next round and I do not take that into account. Do you have an intuition that that might be something in that case, is there going to be an inefficiency? Um, so even without touching on the issue of um, efficiency, so um, I think there are, it's not just about complications, but it's about uh, from a theoretical perspective, like do you want to consider a problem with uh, payoff externality or not? So. Notice that here, as you point out, is that we are looking at a class of decision problems in, in which um, your utility depends only on your action, not on other players' actions, okay? So from a theoretical perspective, we deliberately choose this environment because in this environment, if we manage to generate conglomeration chambers that must be due to purely informational and uh, preference-based reasons. So to us, that's very clear. 
Now, in, if instead of a voting game, let's go the other extreme, a very commonly made assumption in the literature of, game, uh, of network games is that they look at coordination problems. Okay, so instead of voting, let's imagine that uh, we acquire information and then we play a coordination game. And in that case, um, you see that uh, I will be interested in your information because I want to better coordinate with you, not just because I want to learn the true state of the world. Okay, and this idea is actually uh, manifested uh, in several studies on mm -hmm. coordination games with rational inattention, like uh, Dante's paper would be one example and showing that uh, if technology allows, we would like to acquire information about, uh, I would like to uh, suppose that your information is the fundamental plus epsilon, okay? In my setting, I don't care about epsilon, but in a coordination game, I might want to know epsilon because epsilon affects your decision and I want to better coordinate with you. So there might be a uh, diversion of attention, division of attention between uh, the primary source information and uh, the noise term of some other, other players uh, because of the strategic uh, reason. So in some sense, like if I allow for this kind of payoff externality in the utility function, then it becomes a lot easier to generate uh, informational connections between people. Uh, I'm not saying that these things are not interesting to study, uh, but they require very different um, ideas and methodologies. So that's that's my interpretation. Now, coming back to this, your question about suppose instead of coordination games, let's just uh, imagine that we play some pivotal voting game uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the information acquisition stage. Then I believe that uh, there will be. Um, at a very high level, I believe that there are still conglomerations and uh, uh, the characterization of opinion distribution clearly in that, uh, is going to be affected. Um, and also, I mean, if I don't know if you know that paper or not, is that if you consider a fully rational inattention, uh, like rational inattention model in a pivotal voting game, then the signal that you're going to acquire wouldn't uh, wouldn't exhibit any pivotality in the following sense is that the signal that you acquire is going to be a decision recommendation telling you uh, whether or not you should uh, support uh, candidate left or candidate right and uh, in such a way that you should strictly follow that recommendation so there won't be reasonings uh, at the Bayesian updating process uh, that uh, evolves you to reason, well, I'm the pivotal voter, then I should take action left or not. Well, that kind of reasoning is already summarized by the signal structure uh, that's going to rise in equilibrium. So physically speaking, there's always a strictly positive probability that your vote is going to affect the outcome, but the signal realization uh, is going to be such that uh, you're always going to strictly follow that uh, signal realization. So putting all these things together, I think there are a lot more to be done uh, if we would allow for pivotal voting. Uh, there are a lot to be done if we allow other players action AJ to enter my utility function. And uh, we're deliberately looking at a clean environment so that uh, generating echo chambers, is, uh, everything is driven by information consideration. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, does anybody have uh, questions? Uh, just unmute yourselves if you do. Okay, I have one. Uh, I was wondering if, if you have an interpretation for the value of default. Is just looking at theorem one, it's pretty clear that <clears throat> the advantage from playing your default action is what drives the, the echo chamber equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Or more generally, I, I think it's the heterogeneous preferences. Like it, so, so here it's a by a two by two setting. So uh, the heterogeneous preference is summarized by this beta i or the default action. Uh, on a more general level, you could allow for um, okay. definitions uh of heterogeneous preferences. Like, for example, when there are three actions, 
uh, then how are you going to define echo chambers? And uh, you could have heterogeneous preference between taking different actions, right? So here is, for example, how the three by three case is going to work. I'm mostly interested in uh, my, my default action, or I derive most utility from taking action one. There's somebody who was type two, and there's somebody who was type three. So a type one player would acquire information about state two and three, but not state one. Uh, type two player would do one three, type three player would do one two. So we have a generalized echo chamber in the sense that we're gonna pay attention to each other, um, but the amount of attention that I pay in terms of among friends is that I still pay most attention to type one players, um, but at the same time, I still pay a strictly positive amount of attention to type two and three. So uh, I would think of this default as a very convenient way of parameterizing heterogeneous practices. Um, that, that's, 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 that's my takeaway from, from this modeling exercise. So uh, let me just oversimplify this too much and tell me if I'm wrong. So what you're saying is there's no endogenous echo chamber formation. It's actually, we're a bunch of people and we really, we wanna, uh, we have our own preferred action. And the reason we listen to the New York Times and to each other is because, not because we like what they say, but because these are the sources from which we, uh, which we can use to monitor if our default action is a terrible action. If we don't get the bad signal, we we uh, we go ahead with the thing, right? So now, if you think about it like that, it's kind of a strange model of echo chamber formation, although very rational in a sense, like very logical. I don't know how to interpret the strangeness uh, because typically you see patterns that are consistent uh, with these predictions, and uh, these are the patterns that cannot be generalized uh, generated by. Uh, rational models. So as Matt Jensko typically says that, well, if you look at the first layer thing, you see a lot of irrational stuff, but if you dig deeper, then typically there's patterns that are consistent with rational predictions. So it's difficult to say um, if something it's not, uh, uh, it's strange or not. I myself, uh, I have no value judgment about this, but uh, as you suggest that uh, the testable prediction is, is gonna look at the belief distribution before and after consumptions of news. And uh, nowadays people are running field experiments using uh, on social media sphere and uh, we could uh, test these predictions. And um, so that'll be one testable predictions that's gonna separate us from uh, irrational models. I myself don't care if I'm a rational or irrational person. Okay, I'm just going to mention one more empirical fact. The, the just, uh, uh, Seth, just a second. Um, we're going to stop recording.